I'm Maggie Marr, and this is Books to Film and TV, What Every Author Needs to Know. Um, let's see. First of all, I want to thank uh, Michael Anderley and Craig Martell for inviting me to speak. This is the second time I've been uh, to this conference, and the first time, I think, that I've given this presentation at this conference. But I'm really grateful because the, the presentations are amazing, and, and authors are my people. So. So I'm very grateful that they would ask me back this year. Um, so let's get started. I'll give you a little bit of background about me um, so that you know who I am. Well, first of all, here we are, just so you know you're in the right spot. Uh, I am an attorney. So as such, I always start my presentations with this very dense legal, I'm sure you guys have heard it and seen it before. Basically, if I'm your attorney, this is not me giving you advice. If I'm not your attorney, this is not me giving you advice, <laughs> right? So um, that's how I start. Okay, this is about me. So I, too, am a writer. I'm a USA Today bestselling author of over 46 books. Some of them are um, under pen names. I came out with my, late, my first nonfiction title this past year, which surprisingly enough is Books to Film and TV what every author needs to know, right? Um, my background is that I went to Hollywood with my law degree and I started in the mailroom with three other attorneys and a PhD pushing the mail cart. So, so it is true. So I had already run two courtrooms, had had a docket of my own, had done jury trials, but if I wanted in without any contacts and even with contacts, I had to start in the mailroom. So I did my six months in the mailroom uh, then became an assistant to one of to a really great agent, and then eventually got my promotion at ICM, which has now been folded into CAA. And I was an agent who did books to film and TV, <laughs> subsidiary rights uh, for books, and then also represented um, screenplay writers and directors. And I did that for a long while until one of my colleagues uh, sold my first book in a bidding war to Crown. And I left to raise my kids, and I thought be a full-time writer. However, my clients from the agency would still ask me to review their deals, read their materials. And then when my author friends discovered that I understood the film and TV space, they would ask me to read their books and review their deals. Um, to the point where the, the law firm just organically grew up around me. I was writing about an hour to two hours a day, and I was practicing law between six and eight hours a day. And it was my husband who said, if you're only writing for two hours and you're practicing law for six, I think you have an entertainment law firm. And as always, don't tell him I said that. As always, he was right. So he would totally want to know I said that. Um, so this, so if you need to find me, we'll have at the end also, this is our website. I say our, but I mean me. Um, although we are hiring an associate. So, so I wanna, this, this whole presentation came about because when, the, when I was a young firm owner and still in denial about how much I was doing for my author friends, I would get on the phone and I would talk about the entertainment space for hours. I mean, with anybody. Friends, friends of friends, cousins, friends of friends. Um, but what happened is, is that that information, I, it got to where I couldn't do it as robustly and as often as I wanted and still be a parent, stay married, and do my job. So that is how the book came about and that's how this presentation came about. And it really is fundamentally, because I forget having been in the entertainment space for 22 years now, how much information I have up in this head, right? So you'll see, you'll wind me up and I'll just start going. Um, so the number one question that I get asked by authors is, Maggie, how do I get my book made into a film or TV show, right? Everybody asks that. And if I could give you the like number one way to do it, I would probably be in the South of France right now. Meaning that if I knew exactly, so I can't, so this is obvious, right? Because it feels like that when you want to get a book into the film and TV space. I don't know if you guys know this, but on any given day, there are only 10,000 working professionals in film and TV. And by that, I mean entertainment attorneys, producers, executives, development executives. I'm not counting like um, actors or directors. I'm really talking about the people who do the development and come up with the product. Um, and the thing is, is that 
we, we all do start as assistants, right? So if you happen to have a literary manager or a literary agent that specializes in film and TV, the assistant that you're speaking to is someday gonna be running Netflix, right? Because I was an assistant, I was an assistant for what, three years, I answered somebody's phone and I was on all their calls and that was even with a JD degree, right? And after having been an attorney. So keep that in mind, right? Because a lot of the people that I was an assistant with, they now do run studios and that's why my business is able to be robust. So this is how I think a lot of my author friends look when they're trying to understand the film and TV space and how to get into it. Um, and then this is a grumpy old guy because <laughs> here's the thing is that it, one of the things that I think is really interesting is when people ask me, when I go to cocktail parties or events, a lot of people will say, oh, I have a book idea. You ever get that? <laughs> like every person you've ever met. I, I, I would love to write a book. Okay, write the book. Um, but see, the thing is, is that as authors, I, when you ask me how to write a book, I can answer that question, right? I can say, I know exactly how you write a book. That's how you write a book. You sit your tookus in the chair, you make a word count goal, right? Is that, is that math right? Yeah, I didn't become an accountant for a reason. Um, so, but that's the thing, we all know that if we actually put in our daily goals and our word count and all of that, then at the end of that, we'll have 50,000 words and. 50,000 words is arguably a book. Now, it may not be something that anyone but your mother is willing to read, but it is a book. I can't do the same for you with regards to film and TV. I can't tell you, do these three things and you will definitively see your book on screen. And therein, I think, lies the frustration because as authors, we are nothing if not prepared, right? Do we not do research? Do we not? write thousands of words, do we not lock ourselves in our rooms and figure out any problem that we have to with regards to that plot and those characters, right? So, so that is, I think, very frustrating for most of us because I can't say to you, do these three things and you will see your, your project on screen. And yet, there it is, the thing that everybody needs in the town that I work in, right? The book, it's the magic. If you look at, I have a slide in here, we all know that the best projects stem from either books or comic books in my opinion, right? So they all want you, but nobody will take your call. <laughs> Isn't that the conundrum, right? They all want your project, but you can't get through to any one of them. So all the best film and TV shows come from books. See, I promised, and now I've delivered. So funny thing about the Game of Thrones project, my, when I was an assistant, at that time, my mentor was walking, when I say walking, he was trying to set up Game of Thrones, right? This is gonna tell you how old I am. I'm not even gonna tell you what year. So anyway, he was rep, Nick was repping Game of Thrones and he had had George for a long time as a client and he couldn't sell that book, he couldn't give it away. And one of the reasons was is that at that time there were no streamers that were doing episodics to that level. There, there was no such thing as a streamer yet. So Lord of the Rings, not the new one that's episodic, but the old one that was through New Line and was movies had just come out. And with that, what a studios had made all of this great new tech, which allowed for those big, those big action scenes that looked like they had hundreds of thousands of people, but really they were just computer generations. It was the first time that that had really happened. But they were still having the conversation of how do we get these books made into movies, right? Because nobody could, nobody could come, we think of an idea that it could be an episodic because there was no one that was spending that kind of money on episodics at that time. So it took kind of this whole change of the business model with regards to streamers being willing to spend more than you would spend on an independent film. Like what were those per episode? Some of them were like $20 million. I mean, that's a film. So plus the technology to be able to even get his book made. And now I would argue it's one of the most valuable pieces of intellectual property for Warner Brothers and HBO Max but with the spinoffs and everything. It really did change the landscape of what was acceptable for an episodic show. Um, I tell you that because that took, what, 20 years, 17 years? And it not only did it take time, it also took um, a change in the marketplace and a change in technology. And I will tell you this, and this is not gonna make you feel any better. <sighs> One of the things that I have noticed is that oftentimes you can't force something to happen as much as we want to, and you'll see as we go through this is that film and TV is such a collaborative 
process that oftentimes it takes all of the pieces lining up at the right time with the right entity for something to actually get made. I mean, Handmaid's Tale, I think I read that as an undergraduate in college, right? And then here are some more. Can you tell I'm a romance writer? <laughs> yeah. And one of the things I want you guys to, one of the questions that I get asked is whether or not uh, film and TV will look at indies. They absolutely 100% will look at indies. There are probably five to 10 authors and we could all name their names, Stephen King, um, in the fact that they everything that they ever do will get picked up, right? And you will have all kinds of approvals and his deal, Neil Gaiman, and his deal will be completely different than anybody else's. So we know that. Right, we know that that's part of what goes on. Those are outliers. You generally authors don't have the same sort of creative control as, um, as say, the director. I, I want to just hone in on Bridgerton's for a minute because I will tell you that when Bridgerton's hit the screen, and keep in mind I've read all those books and Julia did a great job with those books. They're amazing books. I love them. They're well written. But when it came out, I can tell you that every friend that I have who has ever written anything that is historical sent me an email. <laughs> and while I love their books, I can say, and, and we were able to sell two other series to two other distributors with regards to historical, but that is two out of how many hundreds of historicals, right? And, and I will say that with Bridgerton's, you don't get Bridgerton's the way Bridgerton's is without Shonda Rhimes, all right? Those, those episodes, I'm not sure, I'd have to look it up, but I think that they're running between seven, what, five to 10, seven million per episode because of the visual components. They're a feast for the eyes, and I do mean that. Um, so, <laughs> we've all seen the gifts, right? Yeah, so, so, but the thing is, is that you, and there's something else I wanna to touch on. I was talking to somebody earlier today, and I said, here's the thing, it's a horrible statistic, but I read once that 75% of Americans Never read another book after high school. I don't know where I read it, but I know I read it, but I'd have to, I'd try to find it for you. That's what I read. So if that's the case, think about the most successful author you can imagine. And think about what a small part of the marketplace that is in America. If only, what, 25% of the people who graduated high school are even possibly your audience, and, and the reason I say that is that a showrunner, a producer, a director, a screenplay writer, they take, even if it's a huge best-selling book, something that has a relatively small audience, and they walk it across the bridge into uh, a medium that is for the masses. And I don't think that you can minimize that because once, as writers, generally we sit in a room alone and we write, but once your project gets picked up for film and TV, you're talking about hundreds and thousands of people who are participatory, right? So Shonda Rhimes runs Shonda Land, and um, she created Grey's Anatomy, if you don't know who she is. And right now she has, uh, I think it's a, is it an eight or a nine figure overall deal with Netflix, which basically means an overall deal is that they will, pay for her company, she will in turn bring to them anything that she wants to make or do for as long as she is under that overall deal. So, um, let's see what else. All right, so what I am going to do is tell you the three ways after 22 years that I think is how Hollywood discovers books. And I'm gonna walk through each of them. So there's the organic discovery, the submission event, or the submission and the outlier event. So an organic discovery is kind of like how we discover books, right? So there are hundreds of development executives who work for different studios and streamers as well as production companies who are constantly looking for material. They need your books. They, think about how many hours of programming Netflix has to give every year. What about Apple? What about even Roku is doing original content at this point? Hulu, all of them, they need material. They have to have material, so they employ people to look for material. And those executives find material in much the same way that we do. They scroll Amazon, right? When I want a good book, I scroll Amazon, or I look at my also box. Or they may ask their aunt, have you read anything good? 
Um, the other thing is, is that sometimes they will receive, production companies will receive a mandate from the studio, which is the studio saying, this is the type of material we would like to see from you. And so then the product producer who runs the production company looks at the development executive and says, find me what they want. So then the development executive goes out and looks for the material. Uh, so that's an organic discovery by Hollywood. Submission, that's a lot of what I do, literary managers and agents in film and TV do, which basically means that after 22 years, I have 100 people that I can call that will answer my call and I will call them and say, oh my God, I read this amazing book. I think it's perfect for you. And they will say, send it to me. And I will say, okay. And then I will ask my assistant to send uh, a submission letter that has a PDF of the book, a brief uh, two paragraphs of the book, and I will send it to them, and then the clock will start ticking. Because you have to train your development executives to expect your follow-up call. Books are hard. Books are a hard sell, even though people know that the best material comes from books. Books are a hard sell for development executives because it, on your weekend read, you may have eight scripts and three books. I can read a script in an hour and 10 minutes. I still can't read a book in an hour. And every development executive is the same way. And the thing is, is you have to keep in mind that a development executive, they have to read this, they have to keep looking for material, and then they have to read all the scripts that were turned in by different screenplay writers, and they have to give notes on those scripts because those are the, that's the material that's in active development. So they have to be doing all of that. So I would, I would assert that if you have notes due on a project to a writer or to your boss who's the producer, that probably gets first time and attention than reading a new project that I sent to them because I want them to read it and see if they, should, if they will buy it, right? Um, so that's the submission of it. The outlier event, it is the best story, right? So I think that one of the reasons we love an outlier event, oh, wait, I have to go back. Organic discovery. This is something I tell, every time I give this presentation, I tell people to do this, please do this. Everywhere, 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 where your name is, where your books are, any place, social media, all of it, put these words. For film and TV inquiries, colon, and an email address. An email address that you will check, right? And here's the reason why. Development executives will reach out to you and they will say, probably the first point of contact will be, I really love your book. Are the film and TV rights available? That's code for, I like the cover, I like the blurb, I don't wanna waste my time reading it if you've already sold it to Netflix, right? So there was, and then sometimes I get panicked friends, not so much anymore because I've kind of told them, but I get panicked calls or emails that will say, oh my God, somebody reached out, can I respond? Yes, you can respond. If the film and TV rights are available, please respond and say, yes, the film and TV rights are available. I hope you enjoyed the book. Yeah. Um, because they, they're not gonna read it or spend more time on it unless they know that there's the possibility that if they love it, that they could bring it into the acquisition meeting and potentially get it set up. Does that? Yeah, okay. So the outlier event. The reason we love it is it's the lightning strike. And we are all storytellers, are we not? So tell me if this isn't the best story. You are at the Bellagio. <laughs> and you get on the elevator. And the elevator doors are closing. And as they close, George Clooney pops oh in. Oh my God. <laughs> And then, can you tell this is, well, I won't be sexist. It could be a male fantasy, too. So, anyway, so. Um, yes, it could. Yes, it could. <laughs> yes, it could. Okay, so he pops in and the doors shut and nobody else is getting on. It gets better. So, anyway, he happens to see your lanyard. <laughs> because these lanyards are so sexy. <laughs> And he smiles that, oh my God, he smiles that George Clooney smile. I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a Warner Brothers story about Brad Pitt and George Clooney, if you, I'll, I'll tell it later. <laughs> so anyway, so he smiles that really sexy George Clooney smile because he's got little kids now and he's just happy to be alone in an elevator. <laughs> so anyway, he sees your sexy lanyard and he says, oh, are you here for a conference? And after choking, which I'm, 
know, I, you say yes, yes I am, and, but you can't remember your name or what your book is. Or, and he says, well, what kind of conference? <laughs> and so you, you know, we all talk and we laugh about elevator pitches, but at that point, you say, oh, I write X. And if you're really great, you go, you'd be perfect for it. <laughs> um, oh, okay, thank you. So, so you give him your 20 second pitch, you, you hit the emergency stop so that he doesn't get out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And he says, that sounds great. I, you know, I have a production company. He does have to. And I, I would love to see that. Can I come to your room and get a copy of your book? <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was a fantasy. <laughs> but you didn't bring any. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, so anyway. Right? No, I know, right? So, so that's an outlier event, right? This whole idea that it's a lightning strike, something of, oh, and then the best part is, is that he reads it, loves it, and yes, they option it and make it. That's the, that's the follow-up. So anyway, those are the outlier events, and they're amazing, they're sexy, they're fantastic, and after 22 years in this industry, I would never tell you that they do not happen because they absolutely do. Especially if you live in LA. Right, those things happen. People's cousin, or they'll sit down at a dinner, and somebody will be there. I mean, I had dinner one night with somebody from Boys to Men, and like a, I mean, like just these random things happen. So those are the outlier events, and I think that one of the reasons that we enjoy them so much is, as you can see, they make good stories. They make great stories, and they're incredibly sexy and fantastic, and they do happen. But I wouldn't rely on it. I'd still put your email address. <laughs> For film and TV rights inquiries, right? Yeah. So, oh golly, I went through all this. Look at that. Okay. So, say you get to the point where somebody really wants your material. I want to walk through the three types of agreements that I see, and I'm not going to get into the specific contract language for you. I can tell you that in my book, I did put some examples at the back, which should not be used. Right? There's the legal disclaimer. They're merely examples of the types of um, agreements that I've seen over the past 20 some years. So an option agreement is when a producer or a studio wants to option your material, which is, means they are optioning an amount of time that you will set it aside and you will sell it to no one except for them. Right? You're giving them an option to buy. In those option agreements, oftentimes you get paid it's for a specific period of time. There might be a purchase price that's already negotiated. Um, I'm going to tell you that lately, unless you've got, say, HBO Max, Warner, one of the big studios coming at you with an option agreement that is very specific because then you know the parameters of what they're, what they're going to do in the marketplace. I like an attachment agreement, and let me tell you why. So an attachment agreement, you can still have the option language allows you to receive some money for the time that you're going to set aside your project. But an attachment agreement has this clause in there that says, the purchase price credits and perquisites will be negotiated at the time that the third party financier boards the project. So this agreement is generally done with a producer, a, a showrunner, a screenplay writer, a director, somebody who wants to have control of your material so that they can develop it and add attachments to it. And why do I say this is so important? Because the attachments that they add to the project can elevate how much the studio is willing to pay for your project. Let me give you an example. Two, two guys who were not clients when they signed their attachment agreement had entered into an attachment agreement with a production company who had an overall deal at Lionsgate. So they came to me when Lionsgate was ready to make an offer to purchase the material. And they had this attachment, I don't know where they found it, but they had an attachment agreement that they'd entered into. And they had the clause that said, when a studio or a streamer is ready to purchase, you will negotiate your own purchase price, perquisites, credits, all of the above at that time. So they had received an offer to, from Lionsgate, I told this story earlier today. They had received an offer from Lionsgate Business Affairs in which Lionsgate would purchase the project for $50,000. Eh, this doesn't sound too bad, right? But, but, but. So 
I went and did some research. Who's the production company? Who's the showrunner? Who are the writers? Who's the demographic? Is the demographic being served? And I sent an email back to Lionsgate Business Affairs that said, thank you for the offer of $50,000. My clients would like a million dollars. My phone rang. <laughs> and he said to me, Business Affairs from Lionsgate, I had already worked with before, said to me, Maggie, we're not even in the same ballpark. A million dollars, I offered you 50,000. I said, well, first you didn't offer me 50,000, you offered my clients 50,000. I didn't say that. But anyway, so I did say, I said, okay, so here's the thing, because oftentimes business affairs doesn't know about the creative development. They kind of do, but they kind of don't. Like those things are a little bifurcated, not so much in my firm. So anyway, so anyway, I said, so here's the thing that you don't know. I said, have you looked at the attachments to this project? I know you have a showrunner. It's gonna serve a demographic that is incredibly underserved. This is gonna, this is the reason why this particular series is gonna like blow up for the demographic it's meant to serve, like just went down the list. And he said, I didn't know any of that. I don't know if he did or he didn't. He's like, I didn't know any of that. I said, okay, well then go back to your people and figure out the true value internally for this material because it's not $50,000. He said, okay, but it's not a million. I said, okay. The purchase price ended up being $500,000. So we met in the middle. <laughs> but $500,000 is better than 50. And yes, a million would have been a really good day for them. <laughs> and that doesn't include like the episodic fees and royalties and all of that. But, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, you can be greedy. Yes, you can, especially in Hollywood, they're greedy. They, they will take every bit of what you will give them. So you want to make sure to negotiate. But yes, I do agree with you, like 500,000. Why would, I would not kick that out of bed. So, <laughs> so that's why I like an attachment agreement. Now a shopping agreement generally is, and some attorneys in here will be like, well, how is it a contract? There's no consideration exchange. I, I remember first year contract law. But yet it is something that we do in Hollywood, right? And basically you will have a screenplay writer, a producer that might be a junior producer who's got a lot of hustle and will say to you, could I have three or six months to try to set up your book? I'm not gonna give you any money, but I'm gonna use my sweat equity. I prefer people to give authors money, but there are times, like I've had, I had a situation recently where there is a producer that I know very well. She's like, I know exactly where I'm gonna sell this book because I don't have the money for it, but if you can give, if you, if your client will give me a six month, and sure enough, it's at HBO Max, right? Because she had a really great relationship and I said to my client, you do not have to do this, but if you give her six months, she may be able to come back with a purchase. Um, and she did. So, so you know, I, I say the shopping agreement, it really is up to what you're okay with strategically as an author, because everybody has their own author business. And, and to be honest, I think that one of the reasons people work with me and people like me is because of the market knowledge that we have. Like I can say, like, I keep saying like, I have a 16 year old daughter, I'm so sorry. Um, so just in the example that I gave with the attachment agreement, my two clients, they were excited about the 50K. I was not, knowing all of the elements and who the people were. So I think that it's that knowledge base, that market knowledge of what is happening and what could happen. So once you're under a shopping agreement, an attachment agreement, or any other, what was the other word, option agreement, what happens next? Well, there are many paths, did I put them out? Yes. There are many paths up that mountain. Um, and there's a million ways that you're gonna get from the agreement to the place where you're in production. And I'll just walk through a few of them. It could be that your producer who has optioned your material really thinks that it should be episodic. And so what they'll do is they will try to find a showrunner that has credits and they will come up with a take and then they will take it out. If that producer has a first look or overall deal, they'll be required to go to the studio streamer uh, the studio or streamer that they have their deal with first, they may purchase it, they may option it, they may say, okay, we're off to the races, or they may say it's a pass for us, and at that point, the producer can take it anywhere else. 
Okay, that's one way. Another way is, is that a director may find your material and he may have a vision in mind for your material and he may do something very similar. Uh, except he may have a relationship with a really great actor, which brings you back to my George Clooney and Brad Pitt story, doesn't it? No, but he may have a relationship with a really great actor and he may say, I'm gonna take this book to this actor that I know and we're gonna develop it that way. There are some actors that have very robust production companies. You know, Reese Witherspoon sold hers for, was it 900 million? I don't know, um, 90, something like that. So, but there are a host of actors and actresses that have production companies and they're looking for material that they're not just gonna star in, but they're looking for material that they are possibly going to produce or direct through their company. So there are many paths up the summit to Mount, of Mount Hollywood. So what is a producer and what do they do? So I feel like I've kind of given you this definition just by talking about the entertainment industry, but even my 16 year old daughter the other day was like, what do producers do? <laughs> and what they do is they, they shepherd a project from origin to end. They find the project, um, if it's a screenplay or a pitch, they may have a pitch from a screenplay writer that they like or they may find a book that they like, and they put all of the elements together. They have to know uh, studio executor, executives, they have to know writers, they have to know agents, they have to know managers, they have to know everyone, because they're gonna put all of those elements together, and they're gonna try to get somebody to buy and make this project, and generally they're not gonna get paid until they do. So, um, you see a lot of uh, executives often will have, as part of their Golden Parachute, they will have producer deals with the studio that they've worked at. And that's in part because they know all the people who buy for the studio and what the studio needs. Okay, and then these are, these are places we've all, we've done business with, there's a few others as well. Um, and the thing that's really interesting about this is that while the, while the contracts are fairly similar, the price points are very different, and as you already know, just knowing about these different brands, what they will and will not do, and what, what kind of material they seek, that changes, and Apple should be up there too. But um, that changes over time. I think I added, oh, so this is something, I, this is something that's really important, and I, I know I'm gonna run out of time, and I'll take questions, but I wanted to mention this. So, subsidiary, derivative, ancillary rights. What do I mean? As a book, your book is the, or, or origination or origination of the, it's the material, it's the seed, it's the underlying property, of intellectual property. Say you get a contract for games. You know how gaming apps are kind of big? In the rights grant, this tiny little game, let's just say out of China, has requested film, TV, merchandise, all those rights are in the rights grant. And now you have conveyed those rights to the game, whether or not they're ever gonna exploit them. And you've conveyed them for the term of the agreement. You with me so far? Because a lot of people, funny enough, a lot of people don't read their deals. So um, you sign the agreement and two days later, Netflix calls you, or no, let's make it George. George Clooney calls. <laughs> I've read your book, I wanna option it. I'm gonna make it into a film. <laughs> yes, George, of course. You do the deal memorandum, you go to sign it, some chain of title attorney who's boring figures out that you have conveyed the film and TV rights to an app company in China. Therefore, you cannot convey them now to Netflix. So do you see the conundrum? So while I, I would never say that everyone needs to hire someone like me, what I will say is that when you get an offer for subsidiary, ancillary, or derivative rights, please take a look at what rights you are granting to the licensee, i.e. the buyer. And you can always, you know, strike the things that they don't, you don't think that they need. Just redline them right out of there. And, or email and say, take these things out. Why do you need my film and TV rights if you are making games? I would hazard a guess that why not grab every right that you could possibly grab in case somebody wants to come and buy your company and now you have all those rights. 
Yeah. But this has been something that I've been seeing, and I, I talk about it a little bit in my session tomorrow, too. So yes, this is where we all want to be. Oh, market report. So I wanted to talk, so lately, one of the things that I've seen is I just had a conversation this past week with one of the executives at Netflix that we do a lot of business, and I had said something about, I think this book would make a great episodic, and she said, funny enough, we're going to pivot a little bit from episodic. We're going to go back to 90-minute MOW, and I was like, interesting, why? One of the, and this is not to say everyone, every executive is doing this, and yes, there are outliers and exceptions, but one of the reasons that they're seeing, as we all know, everything at a streamer is a limited series. What do I mean by that? Generally, things don't go more than three years. I think the only series that Netflix has that has gone more than that is Virgin River, which is a book, and I think that it's been picked up for five or six at this point. So. Um, episodics are cheaper and it's not as hard they've discovered through their logarithm to develop an audience because I know that I oftentimes will not start a new series unless I've got eight hours to sit down and make my eyes bleed right <laughs> here if you ever need me or you want you have questions or if I can be of help um, I'm happy to be of help any way that I can so and then can I answer any questions Yes, but I've been told that you need to come to the microphone. And thank you everyone for not falling asleep. Hi. Hi. Um, so we we went through one option and mm -hmm. we weren't happy with it and it expired and, and now we're under negotiation for a second option with a different company. And we just got our long form mm -hmm. thing. And it's got all the little details, you know, like Sada, go between this right. range and this range, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea if those are decent numbers mm -hmm. or pretty good numbers or mm -hmm. crappy numbers. Is there any, and now my agent is a book agent. They're not a, mm -hmm. you know, they're not a, a TV person. Right. Um, I don't know that I can. They already are attached. I mean, that agent's already attached, so I don't right. even know if I can get like an IP attorney to mm -hmm. get involved with this. But is there any way I can find out whether those numbers are like good, bad, or indifferent? And will my literary agent know whether they're good, bad, or indifferent? I cannot speak for your literary agent, and I cannot speak as to their knowledge base. I can tell you that there are a num I have a number of clients who have literary agents who utilize me to negotiate and redline deals such as that, as well as deals that they have with traditional publishers, mm -hmm. right? Um, I do know that one of the things that literary agents used to do, and this was before the advent of indie, oftentimes people would get a literary agent first, and then the literary agent would lean into their relationships on the West Coast and find a subsidiary rights agent, which was film and TV, and then they would rely on that individual and, that, and that's not the case here. It's actually yeah. the, the production company came to us, and I said, you have to talk to my literary agent. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so so like they're getting like, my literary agent's getting like free money here, right? right. Like they did not like shop this around. Right. They just happened to be attached right. to us, and it fell in their, their lap. Or, or is it something where I can have them hire you? <laughs> to you, you know what, and look at Yeah, it would be the, usually the author, and there's, you're welcome to reach out to me. I'm happy to be of service, if not me, someone else, because there are other people, too, that right. understand this space. No, I understand. For sure. Yeah. But, but but there's no way of knowing. There's, like, no, like, like is there a grid a, 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 yeah, a site you go to and say, you know, like. Not to my knowledge. Because, like, like in literary contracts, I know the royalty for hard covers are this to this, and ebook is this, and. You know, I know what all those numbers are, and they're. I know whether I'm being uh, if you're low the, you know, If you're within not. the market parameters, right. right? Right. Yeah, so there are market parameters. I would assert that whatever you are presented with by a buyer is well below what you could get. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I could be wrong, though. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Hi. Hi, Maggie. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Um, love the presentation. Thank um, you. I am a mom of three small children and also a professional full-time author, um, and I re really would like to exploit every IP that I can, mm -hmm. but I have very little time. And so I'm interested in like an agent type person because then I don't get less money, but they do mm -hmm. stuff for me. Mm -hmm. um, 
would could you or to your knowledge do whatever the three ways like that yeah. people find that executives find those scripts you don't really talk at all about what like an indie author could do to put themselves in a good position besides i guess hiring an agent if you were going to get an agent if we were going to go through the submission process like how does an indie author uh put themselves in the best position to find someone to option or, or to, to exploit their movie right. IP rights so I can compare, hey, here's an agent, I can go that route, or I can do all this work. Like, what, what's a first step? Like, is there uh, an association to join that has good info, or is there a, uh, like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there are a lot of great books, and even with the advent of streamers and studios, there's still fewer projects that get made than great books that get published, mm -hmm. right? Um, so a couple things. <coughs> I've also noticed lately that there have been um, the advent of some entities that are a little bit of an outlier, meaning that they, I, I just, be really careful if anyone says to you, we will represent your books, we will take care of your books, but you need to convey your books, right? But what do you mean by convey So I, I just saw something recently where there was an entity that's kind of selling itself as a production company. They, they attach to a piece of material. The author is paying the screenplay writer through the entity, and the entity is taking a percentage of that that would go to the screen. Like they're double dipping, and it's really an outlier, right? So producers generally, um, they're meant to pay you. Shopping agreements are a little bit different, yeah? There are a few um, companies that will do, and we have a packaging department as well, because there are times when I'll say to someone, I don't know who the buyer is for this, but our packaging department might know who the buyer is for this, but instead of commissioning based on the, a percentage commission, they actually charge for their time, right? Ramo Law does it too. Um, I cannot think of a specific place that you can go to. I know that some authors, and I don't know anything about it, but I've had authors and writers say to me, I've been working with Stage 32. The only challenge I have with that is that I think that, just be careful that they don't attach the material that they give notes on, um, and make sure that, like if they, if you're, if you're paying a writing coach to help you with something, that's a little bit different than if you're paying to help you with something plus they're attaching as a producer to your material. That that feels a little bit yeah. like an outlier to me. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that you can do is um, have Move great to LA. Well, no. <laughs> I mean it's so expensive, right? I just had this conversation earlier. You know? So um, write great books. Of course. Have great covers. Mm -hmm. Um on the best list on Amazon. I mean, it can be helpful, right? Yeah, yeah. And then lean into all those any in all relationships because yeah. that can help that can help yeah. as well. I have so many fans tell me, oh please make this a TV know. series. And I'm like, sure, know any producers? You I'd know? love to. Yeah, introduce me to all those producers you know. Well thank you so much for Yeah, me. thank you we for the you. question. Yeah. Oh I think I'm done. <laughs> thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Thank you.